be talking about uh, challenges of hypergrowth. Uh, I, I guess it's a, a thing. <laughs> uh, and mostly I'll be talking about the challenges we had as a company uh, and how we dealt with it. <coughs> so uh, first let's define what I mean by hypergrowth. Uh, basically it's compound annual growth rate of over 40%. There is a better definition there, you guys can read it. Uh, it's not hard to achieve, right, for a startup. You start, first year you get five users, next year you get another five users, you're growing 100%. Uh, so <laughs> let me bring it to uh, our fair definition of hypergrowth. Uh, in less than two years, in our first 18 months, uh, we went from nothing, no software, no anything, to having a marketplace with uh, over $130 million. All the, all the figures here are in Canadian dollars. Uh, I converted them, so I might get confused. Uh, we raised over $155 million in five rounds of funding, again, in 18 months. Uh, it can be done in Canada. We do have a US office as well. We are, we are a split company. We have uh, what I call the Canadian headquarters in Kitchener, and we have uh, our US headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, so these are the things that, uh, the challenge that I'm going to be talking about. Starting up, finding product market fit, which is the holy grail of every startup, uh, unit economics and other optimizations, and finally growth. First thing for people that are starting up, uh, this is like, I have done this wrong before, and uh, this time we did it right. And, and again, I'll be talking a lot about the things that we did right to be where we are today. First mandatory thing, find people you enjoy working with. Uh, if you are building a successful company, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people. It's a long, long-term commitment and a long and hard relationship. You're going to be making a lot of uh, uh, hard decisions together. You're going to be changing the lives of a lot of people. Uh, make sure you have complementary skills. Uh, I did this wrong in the past as well. We started companies with other engineers and we had no business. and. Uh, we learned the, 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 the right way or the wrong way that uh, we didn't know what we were doing. The big thing to ask here is, will you be excited to be working with these people 10 years in the future? If, the, if you're not sure of the answer, you probably don't have the right people. <coughs> the second thing is choosing the idea. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this. Uh, there are, of course, uh, it's very important that you have worked together with the people that you're starting this company before. You know how well you guys interact, you know how well we complement each other. But what are the strengths of your team? Uh, where do you have an advantage? Uh, and know your market. For us, again, as uh, it was mentioned before, we worked at Square for four years together, me and my two co-founders. We built the Cash app for Square, which, uh, yes, it's the number one app in the Apple Store in the US, uh, in the finance category, and it's one of the top 15 in the whole Apple Store. Uh, we knew we worked well together, we complemented each other, uh, and we knew our market. We, fair, at FAIR we were dealing with small businesses, it's exactly what we did at Square for four or five years each. Uh, we knew we had an advantage because we also uh, were very good at executing and we found uh, a problem where uh, the main challenge that we had, we, got, we found this market of uh, wholesale in the US which is really broken, has no technology, and with FAIR we are fixing that. We are like applying like pure force of execution, adding technology to this market that has been completely in the dark of technology and changing it upside down. And that's how uh, our company has been working so well so fast. So finding product market fit, right? It's again, the holy grail of startups. Everybody wants to do this. How do you do it? Uh, first thing, talk to your customers. It, it's, there is no other way. You need you think you know what your customers are thinking. You think you, uh, you, you know uh, how they're going to look at you or your product. You think you're doing a good thing for them. At FAIR, when we started, our first idea was we're going to give people products for free. They're going to carry these products in consignment. If they sell, they pay us. If they don't sell, uh, they don't pay us. We take it back. Uh, so we, we started doing that. And we thought, who is not going to like this, right? It's like. How, how, how can they not love what you're doing? So we started going to trade shows and talking to people, and turns out that uh, uh, just talking about uh, giving these products for free for them wasn't enough. They didn't want it. Uh, consignment has a very bad, poor connotation in retail. People think of consignment as poor quality products that nobody can sell, so they're giving it to us for free, so we put it in our stores for free to, get, to try to get rid of it. 
uh, we, <laughs> we had to figure out how to change that uh, with, again, lots of experimentations. We went to many, many, many trade shows. We were talking to customers. We were changing the product every day. We were like giving things for free. We were giving discounts, free freight, uh, take the products. If you sell, you, you give the money to us. Uh, and that's why I say here, be aware of false growth. Uh, we got growth. You give, turns out that if you give things for free, people are going to take it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, very surprising, right? Uh, and, and it turns out you can grow that way. You give things for free, you show numbers, you're selling. The products are going away. Uh, the reality is that uh, if you're pro if you're, if you, these customers that you take things for free, they're not coming back. They take the things for free, they're not back again. Uh, and your growth goes up and goes down. You need to add value to your users. Uh, and that's where uh, I say message market fit is a thing. Like we talk about product market fit, and when we're telling people that, hey guys, we're doing consignment, this is going to be great for you, and they hated it, we just changed our message. Our message went from consignment, and we, we moved it. And again, it was, this was one experiment in one day of a crazy trade show. We were like, it's not consignment anymore. We have a new term for it. We call it try before you buy. You take the products, you have 60 days to pay. If you sell, you pay. If you don't sell or if you want to keep it, you keep it. If not, you can return it for free, no questions asked. Just by changing your message, things picked up, and we finally found product market fit. It was a very interesting time in our first year because we were going to all these trade shows, and my co-founder and CEO, he was in all of these trade shows. He was calling me and telling me, we found product market fit. And uh, I would be like, that's great. Uh, that's very good. And again, it was all this false growth. We would see the growth, and it would disappear next month, right? Uh, that's the, the main thing about product market fit is this. When you have it, you will know it. And uh, I just have some pictures here. This is like, again, when I say talk to customers, this is us. A company was one month old. We had barely built a product. We didn't really have relationships with any makers. Those, we had those pictures on the wall of products that we told people we sold. Nobody wanted to talk to us in this trade show. Uh, we, we got a little bit better. This is a trade show that we did two or three months later after we had a real designer join our company. And when I say that uh, when you have product market fit, you're going to know it, this is what it looks like. Uh, we went from a little bit of growth, and a lot of it was false growth, uh, to start to grow 227% in a month. And that growth stayed. We, we did 100% or more the, the month after and so on. That's when we raised our Series A uh, nine months in, in November 2017. And that's when we get to the next problem. So everything was looking great, right? We raised the giant Series A. Uh, we are growing very fast. We look at our uh, numbers and unit economics, and we realize that for every dollar that we're selling, we're actually losing a lot of money. <laughs> and that looks really scary when you're growing over 100% every month. Doesn't matter how much money you can raise, it's going to go down. Uh, so that's fine. And that's the first lesson there is do things that don't scale. We hear this a lot, but this is how we apply this, right? We never cared about unit economics. It doesn't matter. If you don't have product market fit, your company is not going to go anywhere no matter what. So if we were optimizing for unit economics, we would have taken a lot longer to find our uh, product market fit. But once we did, then we focused on unit economics. Uh, at that time, we had to do it. And we knew like, there were many things that we, we could do to fix unit economics. We, we weren't like, as an example, we were receiving all these returns. They were going to a warehouse. We were not doing anything with it. Like, eventually, at this point, we started dealing with returns. We started limiting credits and doing other things. Uh, and that's where I say that prioritizing is a challenge for startups. When you're a startup, everything, you don't have anything. So you need to build everything. Everything feels like a priority. You're like, I need, I need things. I need to build them. It's urgent. Uh, picking the right things to work on and the, and the wrong things is what makes companies succeed and fail. So uh, be very mindful of uh, what you prioritize. <clears throat> and yeah, so like from January 2018, just a little bit over a year ago, when we were in this losing a lot of money situation, to June, four months later, we completely turned our unit economics around. We optimized a lot. Uh, we were very, very data-driven for that. And uh, we went from losing money, losing a lot of money on, on every dollar sold on the marketplace, to actually making money. And uh, that's when we raised a very large Series B round of about uh, 55 million. Uh, we made promises to our investors, uh, not promises, projections for, for 
the holiday season that uh, were very aggressive. They believed us. They gave us money. Two months later, we crushed those projections and we raised another $80 million round. Uh, and uh, we came to our next challenge, dealing with growth. Like, uh, now we had product market fit, we're growing, we're still growing fast, uh, we have positive unit economics, everything is looking great. We come to the next phase of our company, which is basically where we are today. I, I don't really have yet lessons from the growth side of the business. We are living it right now. Keeping the bar high is one. Like we, we built everything we did with a very small team. Uh, by the time we raised our uh, Series C, we were about uh, 40 people in the company. Uh, by December, a month or two later, we were 60 people. Uh, today, four months later, we are getting to 120. Uh, keeping the bar high is very, very hard. Uh, but there is one thing here that I want to mention, which is something I heard very early from our investors. Uh, every person you hire in a startup is going to multiply by 10. So every person I'm interviewing, I interview every person up to date, in, at least in Canada, I always think, do I want 10 of this next to me? And, and that's how I, I managed to keep my bar very high. And with my recruiter that's sitting right there. Uh, uh, the, the things we're dealing with now that are very hard as well is, is restructuring our company. Uh, we were very, very good at executing with 30 people. Everybody's focusing on the same thing. We are like changing things very fast, moving very fast. Uh, founders are involved in anything, so there is full context. Now, when you go from 30 to 60 and you start splitting into teams and context is lost, things become much harder. Uh, I don't yet have a solution. We are still dealing with that. We, we, we have tried many things and it's working well, but I don't know if this is going to be the answer. And since we have a hockey game tonight, I wanted to put that quote there. Go where the puck is. Nice, Lyft is winning 3-1, that's perfect. Uh, so this is one thing we did very well as founders during this uh, time. We are always, we are always, always thinking what can go wrong. Like things are going well, things are working, but we are never like resting. We are like, we meet and we are like, what can break our business? What can go wrong? Uh, and we are not ever, because of this, we're never dealing with issues. We, we don't have to hire because we have a problem. We are hiring because we know that in six months we are going to have a problem. As an example of this, when we had 15 people, I started looking for uh, a head of engineering. When we got to 35 people, I hired a head of engineering. I don't need a head of engineering today, but in six months I'm gonna have 60 people, and if I don't have a head of engineering, I'm gonna be in, in trouble. So that's how we have been able to be uh, this successful so far. This is our team in December, the 60 people, and it has, it has almost doubled uh, to date. And we're still hiring. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Um, you mentioned that uh, early on you had a lot of issues with unit economics, and then when you tried to scale it, you had a lot of or you had some difficulty prioritizing. That was like a key focus. Um, like, what were some of the methods that you used to actually prioritize what you did to optimize that? And if, if you don't mind sharing, what are some like the major wins that you guys had? Yeah, I, I think maybe I didn't do a good job at explaining here. We didn't have, uh, we, when we were dealing with unit economics, we didn't have any issues prioritizing. I just mentioned that we left unit economics to be solved after because, again, priorities are very important and we dealt with it when the time was right to deal with it. Uh, again, we knew we would need to deal with it at some point. It, it's scary, right? Because we know that number is there, but again, when we weren't growing too fast, it didn't matter as much. Like we, we had money, we could deal with it for another two years. Uh, if we were we spend time trying to resell returns, for example, or uh, limiting credits for, for some of the smaller businesses that join our platform, it would have taken us a lot longer to find product market fit. Thanks for clarifying. So I'm gonna ask, it's Alex here, I'm gonna ask a question. So with that scale, can you give us a bit more so example, that scale, like how many retailers and suppliers you're dealing with? Uh, let me just think uh, what I can share. <laughs> we do, so up to, to date, we have more than 
80,000 retail shops uh, registered in the platform. We have over, I guess the last official number was 30,000 uh, actively buying, and we have more than 4,000 makers selling on the platform, and we are adding a lot very fast. I'm gonna have a quick follow-up question there. So you did said, do stuff that don't scale. That sounds like scale. So how, how do you scale, how do you know where to focus on scale is products or process at scale versus not stuff that scale? Yeah, so, uh, and again, this is a thing, Y Combinator, we, we also went to Y Combinator uh, a year before them. Uh, y Combinator says that a lot, do things that don't scale, and it, it's real, like, uh, especially being an engineer, it's, we have this urge of fixing things, optimizing, right, and you see things that are broken, and we're like, we have to build software to fix it. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, when we started, and again, we, we, we started by selling, when I say talk to your customers, we started to sell before we had any software. We, to validate our idea, we got our CEO to order products online, walk into a store and tell them, hey, I have all these products here, do you wanna try to sell them? If you sell them, you pay me, if you don't sell them, I'll come here and pick them up. And of course, the store said yes, and actually it turned out, maybe we were lucky, we found good products, they sold it and they loved it, and they told us, if it weren't for this model, we would never have carried this type of products. And we validated our idea enough to start the business. So uh, we were selling, so a month later we built a website, you could place an order, but we had no optimization on the other side of the marketplace, right? So we had people, again, this doesn't scale, but we have people that uh, uh, we would get an order on the platform, they would receive an email, they would call the maker and be like, hey, I just got an order for you here uh, for this little store in Florida. Are you willing to fulfill this order? And turned out that 99% of the time they would say yes. Uh, and we didn't charge any commissions or anything. They were like free sales. And then we did this the second time and the third time. And then we started to explain to them, hey, uh, this is the fourth order I'm sending you. We are fair. Uh, at the time we were called Indigo Fair. Uh, we are gonna charge you a little commission here, 5%. Are you okay with that? They were like, yes. We're like, huh, let's increase this commission. <laughs> so, so this obviously doesn't scale, right? But we, we proved the business. At the same time, we were building software nonstop. At the time, we were working like seven days a week, 14 hours a day, uh, nonstop. And eventually, we got to, the, to a point where we had too many of these orders and we couldn't handle them manually anymore. And we optimized all of that. And, and so that's what I mean. And again, this goes hand in hand with Priority is very important. What do you work on? What's the next thing that you must build? Uh, focus on that, get it right, then move on to the next thing. Cool. Yeah. Can I do this? Yeah, so I have a question right over here. Uh, yeah, so when you're going from like 30 to 60 people and constantly doubling and then going through different r rounds of funding, how can you still ensure that the new employees feel as invested as the older employees and the older employees don't feel, oh, hey, this new person is going to get more responsibility than I have, and now the new person wants to have a lot of impact, and like there could be this sort of rift between the older employees and the newer ones. So Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we talk a lot about that to the company, and we have been talking about it from day zero. We, we, we talk about uh, sharing your Legos. You know, like when you're a kid and you have all these Legos and another kid joins and you have to give some. It's very hard because when you start a company, especially a small startup, you're looking for generalists, right? You, you need people that are wearing multiple hats at the same time. Uh, and we found amazing people that could wear multiple hats and with a very small team, everybody wearing multiple hats, we built something very big. Uh, and then we start to bring in new people and then you're like, okay, you have to give one hat to that person and another hat to that person. Uh, I think we have talked so much about this over, uh, again, the short life of our company to all of the people that joined that people already have that mindset and they, everybody's so busy uh, that they are happy to give away their Legos uh, in a way as well. Uh, and what happens is as we start to scale more, you start to transition a little bit from having a lot of uh, generalists into having more specialists. You're gonna start to hire people that have done it before and are very good at that one specific thing. And again, uh, the people that we have, they're very happy to have somebody, sometimes more senior than them, come in and help them with one of the things that they're, that they're doing. Uh, ownership, I think, uh, again, everybody in our company 
from customer support to uh, engineers get stock options and they all have ownership. We want them to feel like owners, and I think they do. And they all also share our mission, which is a, a big part of our interview process. I care that the people that are joining us not only are great at their jobs, but they also believe in what we're building. Like, we're trying to do something great. We're trying to change commerce, change the lives of retail and uh, small retail shops and small makers. Uh, and uh, the beauty of our platform is that for us to succeed, we need both sides of our marketplace to succeed. Uh, and it's, it, I, I, if people don't believe in that mission, they shouldn't be joining us. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you.